Je l'ai résumé au cardinal Ratzinger, en quelques mots. Vous voyez, même si vous nous accordez un évêque, même si vous nous accordez une certaine autonomie par, par rapport aux évêques, même si vous nous accordez toute la liturgie de 1962, de 1962 si vous nous accordez enfin, les, de continuer les séminaires et la fraternité comme nous le faisons maintenant, nous ne pourrons pas collaborer. C'est impossible. Impossible. Parce que nous travaillons en direction diamétralement opposée. Vous, vous travaillez à la déchristianisation de la société, de la personne humaine et de, 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 de l'Église, et nous, nous travaillons à la christianisation. On ne peut pas s'entendre. Rome a perdu la foi, mes chers amis. Rome est dans l'apostasie. Ce n'est pas des paroles, ce n'est pas des mots en l'air que je vous dise. C'est la vérité. Rome est dans l'apostasie. On ne peut plus avoir confiance dans ce monde-là. Il, il a quitté l'Église, on quitté l'Église, il quitte l'Église. C'est sûr, 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 sûr. Le following programme was made possible by the generosity of those who have determined to hold fast to the true Roman Catholic religion, as expounded by the Roman Catholic Church before the disasters of Vatican II and the so-called New Mass. Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. Come, Holy Ghost, fill the hearts of thy faithful, and kindle them with the fire of thy love. Set forth thy spirit, and they shall be created, and thou shalt renew the face of the earth. Let us pray, O God, who didst instruct the hearts of thy faithful by the light of the Holy Ghost. Grant us by that same spirit to be truly wise, and ever to rejoice in his consolation. Through Christ our Lord, Amen. May the divine assistance remain always with us. And may the souls of the faithful departed through the mercy of God rest, rest in peace. Amen. And our very seat of wisdom pray, pray for us. us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Hello, and welcome to What Catholics Believe. I'm your host, Thomas Nagley, and with me tonight is Father William Jenkins. He's a member of the Society of St. Pius V. He's also the pastor of Immaculate Conception Church right here in beautiful Norwood, Ohio. Hello, Father. How are you? Very fine, Tom. Yourself? Well, Father, thanks for being here. Good. Well, thank you. That's mutual. Father, there have been a few developments in the Vigano slash McCarrick slash Francis uh, ordeal, so I'd like to dive into those, where apparently Father Francis has openly denied that he knew anything of Cardinal McCarrick's immoral behavior. Uh, this directly contradicts what uh, Cardinal McCarrick has said, and now after this interview with Francis, uh, Vigano has come out, I believe, in an interview with LifeSite News, and he has directly accused Francis of lying. He said that, that this is a lie, saying that Francis didn't know anything about this. So what's your take on this, Father? Where, where do we stand now in this whole ordeal? Well, Archbishop uh, Carlo Maria Vigano published his, some call it an expose, it was kind of a letter, an open letter, saying that Francis was well aware of uh, Theodore McCarrick's uh, predations on young men, especially in the seminaries. And um, then, uh, of course, Francis refused to comment on it. In that very famous uh, news, news, uh, uh, what do you call it, um, uh, press, press interview, press whatever he had on the airplane afterwards, right? right? Back from Ireland, in fact. Uh, he said he will not say one word about this, right? but he told the journalists, you know how to take care of this, you know how to handle this, right? And uh, immediately then the press uh, around the world began to uh, attack uh, Archbishop Vigano, attack his character, to try to discredit his charges there. <clears throat> but of course, the, the point is uh, that uh, all of this time, Francis has refused to uh, deny that he knew about it or refuse to acknowledge that he knew about Theodore McCarrick's uh, sexual abuse of the Novus Ordo Seminarians. And um, 
So the Wall Street Journal actually published just, uh, I think today even, just today, a story about this. Uh, Francis acknowledged to a Mexican uh, television station, Televisa, that he did not know about this. Finally, he comes out and answers uh, this charge. Here's what the Wall Street Journal report says. Uh, it's by Francis X. Roca, R-O-C-C-A, dated May 28th. And uh, it's uh, actually a dateline Vatican City. It says, Pope Francis responded for the first time to an accusation that has dogged this pontificate, his pontificate, since last year, denying that he knew about former Cardinal Theodore McCarrick's history of sexual misconduct before it was revealed by a church investigation. <clears throat> Quote, they're quoting Francis now, I knew nothing about McCarrick, obviously, nothing, nothing. The Pope said in an interview with Mexico's Televisa network, according to a transcript published Tuesday by an official Vatican News outlet, Vatican News, Quote, I knew nothing about McCarrick, otherwise I wouldn't have remained silent, right? <laughs> that sounds peculiar, doesn't it? He <laughs> said, I wouldn't have remained silent, right, if I knew. <clears throat> uh, now, of course, we know that McCarrick, this 88-year-old former uh, Cardinal Archbishop of Washington, right, uh, was denounced for having sexually attacked seminarians, abused them. And... Uh, you know, this is extremely grave, not only in terms of sin, uh, but the sin of impurity, but the sin of scandal as well, okay? Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a scandal that goes right right up to, to, uh, to Francis. Uh, Archbishop Vigano has, has made clear that Francis uh, enabled uh, this predator, and uh, if this predator, we might say many other predators too. Francis is well aware of what was going on. According to Vigano, this is the uh, this is the story. This is what we should see happening. And uh, in fact, everything that Francis has done, as far as his appointments and his promotions in the hierarchy of the Novus Ordo Church, uh, corroborates what Vigano said: <clears throat> that Francis is promoting homosexuality, and uh, not only homosexuality in terms of uh, his appointments to the hierarchy, but in terms of the again the cover up of uh, the homosexual abuse of seminarians. And uh, the article of uh, the Wall Street Journal continues, last August a former Vatican envoy to the United States published a letter accusing Pope Fran Francis of ignoring Mr. McCarrick's history of misconduct with adult seminarians and making Mr. McCarrick a powerful advisor. The envoy, Archbishop Carlo Maria de Ganon, said, he had informed Pope Francis of Mr. McCarrick's history in 2013. That's the year that Francis was elected as the pontiff of the Novus Ordo, telling the Pope that his predecessor, Pope Benedict XVI, had placed the then cardinal under restrictions to punish him for the misconduct. <clears throat> in October, the Vatican confirmed that Mr. McCarrick had been restricted from travel and public appearances and told to lead a, quote, discreet style of life of prayer and penitence because of rumors about his behavior. And this uh, Wall Street Journal article continues then. At a news conference in August last year, uh, Francis declined to respond to Archbishop Vigano's accusations. He has maintained a public silence on the matter until now. In the new interview, Pope Francis appeared to refer to his previous private denials of the accusations, saying, I said so several times that I didn't know, had no idea. <clears throat> but he also said, regarding Archbishop Vigano's account of their 2013 conversation, I don't remember if he spoke to me of this. If it's true or not, I have no idea. The Pope said his public silence had been inspired by that of Jesus before Pontius Pilate on Good Friday. Quote, before a climate of cruelty, one cannot answer. And that letter by Archbishop Vigano was a work of cruelty, Francis said. <clears throat> well, apart from his uh, take of that as, as, a, as a work of cruelty, which is simply a matter of warning the Catholic people um, and the would-be Catholic people 
about the, uh, the, the grave, grave crimes, right, in the hierarchy of, of their Novus Ordo church, <clears throat> and the arrival of a, a predator-in-chief, right, who would kind of uh, cover, the, cover up the whole thing uh, as their pontiff. Uh, it didn't seem to be really so much a work of cruelty as it seemed to be a work of charity to expose a very great evil, right? But Francis, of course, would consider it to be a work of cruelty because it concerns his failure, his failings. <clears throat> Remember, the Pharisees thought that Christ was being cruel to them because he was exposing their faults and their failings, and they hated him for it, right? Um, they, they blamed him for it. They said it was even the work of the devil, right? Mm -hmm. Sounds familiar. It sounds like Francis, doesn't it? The work of the devil to do this, to expose this, right? Mm -hmm. But it's just incredible to me that he says, with regard to Archbishop Vigano's account of their 2013 conversation, in which Archbishop Vigano said, I brought this to his attention. I told him in the Vatican that this is what was happening with the Carrick. He was put under these sanctions because of what he had done. <clears throat> and Francis says, I don't remember if he spoke to me of this. If it's true or not, I have no idea. <clears throat> Tom, I'm sorry. This... This is not the, 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 uh, the response of an honest man. And what is really tragic uh, is that this man is so corrupt in terms of, uh, of truth and falsehood that he thinks that he's going to fool people, that he can fool other people by saying these things. Mm -hmm. I have no idea. Sounds like, you know, Bill Clinton and others on the stand. Well, I, I have no idea. I don't remember any of this. Uh, but the fact that he would say this publicly, that I don't remember if Vigano ever told me about this. I never knew, but I don't remember whether Vigano told me about this in 2013. I have no idea. Isn't that a direct contradiction? To, he, 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 for a rational person, it is. Yeah. <laughs> he, he says he, he's lying, he's lying, but I, I have no idea if that's For an honest about. person, it, it would be a lie, yes. Yeah. But I think with Francis, I, I think it's something so pathological that I, I uh, have a hard time, a hard time um, uh, getting my mind around how perfidious he really is. Mm -hmm. well, Father, I mean, here's a man who has just come out and said that the Catholic Church has to part with all our traditions. Right. At the same time, this man has absolute reverence for the religions, for the traditions of every other religion on the face of the earth. He reveres Muslim traditions. He reveres, reveres the traditions of the Amazonian tribes. He reveres their tra traditions, right? And all of his cohorts in the, in the, uh, in the uh, Vatican, after Vatican II, right? Uh, John Paul II, Benedict XVI, they've all had these liturgies with these native, native religions, right? Doing their thing and following their traditions. Uh, and they would never dare, dare object to uh, any of these things. But the only thing that they have an absolute contempt for is Catholic tradition. Mm -hmm. And that is the one thing that Francis wants to eradicate from the face of the earth. He's, he's dedicated his so-called pontificate to that. So again, it's, it's hard to uh, even to see this as anything but a pathological frame of mind. But this pathology is, uh, is at the very heart of modernism. Tom. It's the very heart of this heartless modernism. Uh, so, uh, in saying that Francis is a pathological liar, I would just be saying uh, that he's a modernist. Right. And we should expect this of modernists, fact, as we would expect it of abortionists. Perhaps this is a, a manifestation of, of what you talked about on, on your most recent program, where you mentioned this idea of how Francis is being em emboldened by, uh, by, by the response that he, ha he has received from the media and all of this, where he essentially just feels that he can do, he can say whatever he wants because he doesn't really get any kind of, uh, there's no consequences to any of it. And so he can, he can stand up here, he can say uh, silly things like this that are, are manifest untruths mm -hmm. at best, and uh, he can get away with it. Well, the problem is, Tommy, he's being emboldened not only by the, by the press, but he, he knew they were on his side to begin with, okay? Just as Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama, they all knew the press was on their side. So Francis knows that the press is on his side. But now the problem is, he feels emboldened by the response to the so-called conservative Novus Ordo Catholics, who claim to be traditional, but they're not, because they're following the Novus Ordo. And these are the ones who are insisting most adamantly that Francis is the Pope, and you have to recognize him as Pope. You can't even question that he's the Pope. And he's emboldened by this now because he's already been through the dubia 
<clears throat> nothing whatsoever happens to him. He just ignores it, right? He, he's had this letter, it turned out, accusing him of public heresy. And all these conservative Novus Ordos do is they turn on each other and start squabbling among each other, you know, among themselves. Should this have been written? Should it not have been written? Was it respectful? Was it disrespectful? Pius X, the society of Pius X finally gets involved, and they put down the accusation of heresy against Francis. And uh, so, I mean, what does Francis have to fear from these people? Nothing, Nothing at all. Nothing. In fact, uh, they're, they're at the point where, uh, with this uh, Bishop Schneider, telling him, look, he, he's, he's, a, you know, he's, a heretic, he's a heretic, there's nothing we can do. There's nothing we can do. We just have to live with it and try to survive it. That's all we have to do, survive with your faith, because he's a pope, and no one can, can doubt that or question that. So why wouldn't Francis think, there's absolutely no one out there who can question me about this? I have free reign to do what I want, to go on an absolute rampage and finish the destructive work of Vatican II. Nobody can stop me. And uh, this is the tragedy of it all, that uh, these are the people who apparently still have the faith, but have basically disarmed the faithful before the modernist uh, monsters who are going to wreak havoc in the church. And um, they're, they're actually attacking the very structure of the church now, as you know, with what Francis, what changes Francis is making now. But Francis feels that nobody can oppose him, so he, he has a, an absolute, uh, you know, free, it's a free way open to him now mm -hmm. to do whatever he pleases. So do you see any good coming from this, this whole uh, Viganel affair? Because at this point it seems that it's devolved to, to name-calling, essentially, where Francis says he's lying, Viganel says he's lying, and nothing really comes about. What, what do you see happening? Well, again, I, I think it's a stalemate, and Francis wins a stalemate, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, that is why, you know, I've just kind of appealed to these people who still have the faith to stop this, uh, this, this, this fatalistic process of empowering Francis uh, to act as uh, freely as though he were a Catholic pope. I think they have to at least say, look, there is a, there is a serious doubt. There, there is no doubt that no pope has any authority to do what he, this man is doing as far as attacking the faith and attacking the church, okay? But there, there is this doubt, at least they can say this much, there is an objective doubt as to whether or not he really is the Pope, okay? I'm not even asking them to come out and say he's not, okay? Because that would be, again, I mean, that would be their own personal opinion of the matter. Um, but the fact is, you know, to acknowledge the fact that there's an objective doubt would stop here and now uh, his, his authority would call into question all of his acts and mean that they cannot be accepted as the acts of a, of a, of a supreme pontiff. But the authority of a supreme pontiff to do what he does to the church. You know? even, even that doubt, the expression is Papa Dubius Papa Nullus, which is a Catholic principle. A, a pope who's doubtful is not a pope in practice because his authority is in doubt. And you cannot simply accept a doubtful authority when it, when it acts and especially does such drastic things against the church. You have to say, okay, this is on hold right now. That's the very least they can, they, they can do. It's the very least they have to do to, in order to really oppose him and stop um, the, the, the just universal acceptance among them of the things that he's doing to attack the church. And Father, that's really the only reasonable place that we can possibly go from here because we see now there can be the most incriminating evidence possible against Francis and, and nothing sticks to him, nothing whatsoever. He could, uh, like I, I said a few programs ago, he could come out tomorrow and say God does not exist and yet he would still have all of his, all of his defenders, everyone uh, you know, defending him and, and saying he didn't mean it this way and so on and so forth. Nothing sticks to him. Well, now some are even, uh, some of these Novus Ordo bishops, like, oh, Novus Ordo, even if they're saying the, the 1962 Latin liturgy, <clears throat> um, and, and consider themselves traditionalists, quote unquote, um, nonetheless, I mean, they are, they are enabling him, and they are empowering him, they are, um, what was the word that they used even, in terms of emboldening him mm -hmm. to do what he's doing. Uh, simply by the fact that they say, well, he's the Pope and there's nothing you can do about it. 
And uh, that is not the correct answer. That's not what the church says. Some of them are even saying, well, if we could just find 11 or maybe 12 cardinals who would agree, right, that he's at least doubtful, or there's a question, or rebuke him, or yes, this letter is said that to impose canonical sanctions or whatever, uh, then that would be enough, you know, to, to, to raise the question. But that's not, they're, they're misunderstanding something very serious. St. Francis de Sales, uh, the theologian Cajetan, and others did speak about the idea of finding a pope had defected from the faith and um, was guilty of heresy and attacking the church and so on, and not deposing him, but just announcing that he had died to the faith. He had died spiritually, right? By losing the faith, he no longer was a member of the church. He could no longer be the head of the church, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, but, uh, you know, when the, when the people who wrote this letter accusing Francis of public heresy uh, say that they want the Novus Ordo bishops, who are all appointed by the Novus Ordo, they're all new order, you know, even the most conservative of them, okay, is still part of the new order uh, of Vatican II, um, you know, want them to somehow get together and acknowledge that Francis is in fact guilty of public heresy, and to follow through with the canonical uh, results or canonical sanctions for it. But one does not have to wait for that to recognize there is a doubt, that there's an objective doubt. One doesn't need a, a council of cardinals, even if they were thoroughly Catholic, as in the, in the old days, right, to get together and announce, yes, there is a doubt about this papacy. <clears throat> Uh, this is, is not a matter of making a canonical statement about this, okay? Uh, there, there's a prov provision in the old canon law for someone being sus suspect of heresy. This being brought to his attention, and after a period of time and there's no reform, then he is guilty, okay? The old code of canon law, the traditional code of canon law, said after a lapse of a certain time, after someone was notified, six months but passed, there's no reform, there's no retraction of the heresy, right? Then one is understood to be guilty of heresy, and yes, pertinacious, because there was no, no uh, correction after the, after the correction, so to speak, right? But, um, so one does not have to have some kind of, go through a canonical process in order to arrive at the conclusion that, that this papacy is in doubt. Okay, and there are so many uh, arguments uh, against it that, that one could actually, you know, beat Mart one could beat the, uh, you know, all of the lists that the Protestants did up, you know, made up against the Catholic faith. One can, one could uh, easily double that with regard to Francis. Um, but this is not a matter of. <clears throat> Uh, you know, reacting as Protestants react. This is reacting as Catholics reacted against a Protestant error here. And Francis is guilty of far more than Protestant errors. He's already said that he he uh, concurs at his church concurs with uh, the Lutheran concept concept of justification, mm -hmm. which the church has formally condemned as heretical. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but then the list goes on and on and on. Right. Okay. So, um, you know. Mm -hmm. One simply should logically and uh, also um, in terms of, of the Catholic faith acknowledge that there is an objective doubt with regard to the authority of Francis. And one, I, I think we'd have to say that's the very least that one can say. Right. And Father, why is it so easy to get hung up on this question? You know, just over the weekend I, I had the privilege to speak with a... Uh, with a, a Catholic, and he was he was telling me how so many you know will will focus on this question of is Francis the Pope or not the Pope? You have to say that he is the Pope. You have to say that he's not the Pope. And he made the point: well, it, whether he is or whether he's not, it's not going to affect my life, me personally. I'm I'm going to practice the traditional faith regardless of, of what what Francis does in the Vatican. You know, he says it. At most we in our daily lives will often pray for the intentions of the Supreme Pontiff, but that has nothing to do with, with Francis. The intentions of the Supreme Pontiff are laid out very clearly by the Church, and whether or not Francis embraces these 
does not mean that we are necessarily praying for what Francis wants. We're praying for what the, the true Roman Catholic, traditional Roman Catholic Church wants. So why, why is it so easy to get hung up on this idea uh, of what Francis does, of, of what this, this man in the white robes in, in the Vatican does? Because they are insisting that he is a pope. He's a vicar of Christ on earth. They're insisting on that. But it doesn't change the everyday life of a traditional Catholic. A traditional Catholic should be following Well, they're not traditional Catholic Catholics, though. I mean, the people who are saying that are not traditional Catholic. They're the Novus Ordo. They're the conservative Novus Ordo types. We're empowering and emboldening Francis to do what he does. But as far as traditional Catholics go, you see, for a, a traditional Catholic to be at all logical and even to be Catholic, they can't just say, well, I don't care whether he's the Pope or not. I mean, he can be the Pope and I don't have to pay any attention to him. Right. That's not a Catholic idea right. at all. Right. Okay? So for a Catholic, to, well, even look, look at the Society of St. Pius X. Look at how illogical that position is, okay? Yes, he is absolutely the Pope, and you don't dare question it. If you do, you're a state of a countess, they say, okay? Uh, is it honest? No. But that's, that's the accusation they, they hurl around. Okay, that's the term they misused. It applied to everybody who disagrees with them. Um, <clears throat> but the fact is, this is not a Catholic approach. You cannot say, yes, he's the Pope, absolutely, he's the vicar of Christ on earth, he has authority from Christ, right? But I don't have to do anything he says. Right. I'm totally exempt from anything he says, because whatever he says, he says as a liberal, they have a hard time getting the word modernist, modernist out, but occasionally they'll use it. Archbishop of Fed was very clear about using the term modernist. For some reason, the pious attend likes to concentrate on this idea of he's a liberal, okay? Um, but... You know, I asked one of the Pius X priests once, uh, you know, if, if you say Francis is absolutely Pope, oh, yes, we do. Well, if he could, commanded you to get up in the pulpit and to announce uh, a fast, a day of fast and abstinence for world peace, would you do it? No, 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 of course not. I said, well, why would you not obey him? He said, well, because he speaks as a liberal, and a liberal means that if we're fasting for world peace, they mean ecumenism. So we're not in favor of ecumenism, so we're not going to obey a command like that. So, so you say that's giving him the benefit of the doubt, to interpret his words this way, that you can actually avoid any responsibility to, to obey anything he says. He's, you know, Our Lady said at Fatima that we should offer sacrifice for world peace in the world, right? Okay, so he gets up and he says, essentially, uh, fast and abstain for peace in the world, and you say we don't have to pay any attention to that. And his answer to me was no answer at all. I said, well, you wouldn't do it. And I said, well, of course I would. If I believed that Francis was truly the Pope and there was no doubt in my mind, and he commanded that we fast on a certain day and abstain on a certain day for peace in the world, <clears throat> I certainly would feel obliged to obey that. And I would be obliged, I should feel obliged to get in the pulpit and tell everybody else in the church to do that too. If I was, was convinced, as you say you are, that he is the Pope. He said, oh, no, you wouldn't. I said, yes, I would. So that's the difference between you, the Society of St. Pius the Tenth, and your whole approach, that you insist that he's the Pope and you feel obliged to obey nothing that he says, okay? Except unless it's in your favor, unless you can use it in your favor somehow. But, uh, you know, the rest of us who are traditional Catholics, we actually believe in the papacy, which is why we, we believe that the papacy has to be protected against someone like Francis, a modernist, who would destroy it, you know? You intend to just kind of go along and use it. Anyway, we're still friends, but uh, uh, clearly there's a, there's a real difference there. But a Catholic has the attitude, it really does have respect for true ecclesiastical authority. A, a true traditional Catholic yearns for real ecclesiastical authority, but he doesn't find it in the modernists who make a mockery and a pretense of it to use it to, to abuse it to destroy the church, okay? And this is why the traditional Catholic says, I must oppose this, absolutely. And why he also says that because the abuses are so very bad. I mean, the, the attacks on the faith and on the integrity of the Catholic religion are so evil that they do, do call into question a reasonable, objective doubt about the legitimacy of these men whether they are Catholic popes or bishops or cardinals or anyone, right? And that's the very least that a traditional Catholic could say to justify being a traditional Catholic. And uh, that is to say, okay, I'm going to follow the traditional Catholic faith regardless of what they say.
They couldn't say that if they believed with all their heart and soul, if they were absolutely convinced that these men were the Catholic hierarchy. They couldn't say that. Hmm. <clears throat> and uh, to actually say, okay, I believe that these are the, this is the true Pope, and these are the true cardinals, and these are the true bishops of the Catholic Church, but I'm going to ignore them, and I'm going to be traditional Catholic in spite of them. I mean, there, there is somebody who has a truly non-Catholic attitude. Um, I find that the only ones who really have a traditional Catholic respect for the traditional Catholic hierarchy and the traditional Catholic religion are those traditional Catholics who realize that what these men have done is so egregiously against the faith, against Christ, against the Church. They are the enemies of the faith, the enemies of Christ, the enemies of the Church, even as Archbishop Lefebvre said they were. Okay that uh, they, their authority is, is doubtful. Wow. And uh, what I must do in a case like this is I must hold to the traditional Catholic faith, faith no matter what. Mm -hmm. But that's the problem with the Society of St. Pius X now. They're, it's like they're playing some kind of sadistic game almost, trying to game this system to, the, to their own advantage and scuttle the real, real traditional Catholic Catholicism. I was just reading the other day where they were even claiming that Archbishop Lefebvre, well, it was in response to this, this letter of uh, charging heresy, charging Francis with heresy. But the, the website that they uh, carried their statement on this, on this letter said that Archbishop Lefebvre would never do such a thing. But you know, they don't know him. They are the Reformed Society of St. Pius X. The Reformed, as in the Reformation, okay? They're making like a separate piece with the modernists now. <clears throat> but uh, I don't think Archbishop Lefebvre would recognize them. I don't think he would recognize this as the priestly fraternity of the Society of St. Pius X that he founded. <clears throat> if you go back and you read some of the things that he, that he wrote, and even, even the video clip we had in the beginning of our What Catholics Believe episodes, which I'd like to actually be part of this, um, you can see the real, the real spirit of Monsignor Lefebvre. And he was not a, um, an appeaser with modernism mm -hmm. by any means. Mm -hmm. He condemned it <clears throat> uh, with every fiber in his Catholic being. And every fiber of his being was Catholic. Okay. <clears throat> so, but this is how they, the, the Society of St. Pius X has had a makeover. And they want to make over Archbishop Lefebvre too. And Father, you mentioned how uh, you know they, they will often refer to Francis as a liberal and refrain from using that, that modernism term. And one of the uh, reasons behind that that's uh, been postulated is that perhaps um, it would be a bit awkward for the, the priest of the Society of St. Pius X to denounce rather to denounce the uh, the Novus Ordo clergy and Francis and, and all of his all of his fellows there in the in the Vatican as modernist as they are at the same time trying to uh, try, trying, trying to, right. to, to, to make Forge, an agreement. Forge formalized right? ties. And uh, so that would, that would make for a bit of an awkward situation to, <clears throat> Rather. you know, to denounce them as, as modernists and then mm -hmm. try and try and uh, form an agreement with mm -hmm. them at the same time. But um, You see this pattern, though, okay, that you have more and more the conservative Novus Ordo's being increasingly uncomfortable with Francis and what he says, and the society of St. Pius X is almost running interference for Francis. It seems that way. Trying to sound like the voice of moderation, you know. Mm -hmm. um, this is a very bad sign. And there are many uh, members of the Society of St. Pius X that I personally spoke with who believe that there's already been some sort of agreement made with, mm -hmm. between the Society and, and Francis. It just has not been, been made public yet. And so that's why there's kind of this, this period right now where they're, they're trying to kind of, uh, you know, work up some kind of relations with them and try and, try and ease things over before they announce this agreement. So... That's been, been postulated. There's not uh, anything definite there, but that's that's an idea that's been thrown around. But just in regards to uh, to them not not mentioning modernism a whole lot, there's um, just there's been a story that I recently heard. I don't have any any exact details on it, but uh, of some a talk of uh, pertaining to modernism that has been going around some members of the Society of Saint Pius X. And uh, this, this bishop who gave this talk, this bishop's not a member of the Society of St. Pius X, but he gave this talk on modernism. And apparently some members of the Society of St. Pius X have gotten a hold of this talk, and it has made a lot of hay with mm -hmm. the members of the Society of St. Pius X, they, the parishioners there. They say they've never heard anything like this before. Mm -hmm. This is yeah. totally new to them. It's, I'm, I'm it's, sure it's true. It, it's incredible <clears throat> to hear. And I, I think but I, I heard that they suppressed the author's name. They did. 
They suppressed the name of the author of that work. Mm -hmm. Why? Uh, because they didn't. They, they, don't they didn't want, want the people to, to know. <laughs> That's right. And there was Who even, wrote them? there was even a uh, there was even I, and then again this is this is just what I've I've heard secondhand. So I don't have any any documented facts. But I heard that they uh, there was actually one point in the talk where the bishop mentioned the Society of Saint Pius X uh, in, a, in a negative light, and that audio was actually cut out. Mm -hmm. okay. of, of the recordings, so, <laughs> so they edited that out. I think that just goes to show um, the, the the true nature of what's going on there. Well, afraid it's, it does. It's very sad. It does, Tom. It's, it's worrisome. I'm saying this not to uh, you know. Really, it sounds like an attack. I I, I imagine, but it, I'm very concerned. I'm very worried about this because there are a lot of good people who are tied up in this. Definitely. And they're trying to be traditional Catholic, and I think they're being led. And like the the Pied Piper, they're being led down this this path in the very wrong direction. So, um, in saying this, I mean, I, I I impress upon everyone, I try to, the need to pray for the members of the Society of Pius X. But I would also say, pray for Francis, pray for his conversion. Sure. And uh, with regard to Pius X, pray for honesty, pray for the, the that they be honest about their dealings and their standing up for the faith. You know, Tom, uh, the Saudi of St. Pius X actually accepted the 1960-1962 changes in the Mass of John XXIII. <clears throat> they kept the Latin, okay, but they, they say they accepted the 1962 liturgy. There's a reason why the Vatican wanted those early changes of John XXIII incorporated into any deal. They, could, they wouldn't just agree to let them use the traditional Latin Mass before John the 23rd. They had to include the John the 23rd changes because that's like the, the little grains of incense that you burn before the idol of the Novus Ordo. It's, it's like saying, okay, <clears throat> well, we accept the principles behind these changes. They're Catholic enough. And this was the beginning of the revolution of the change of the liturgy. So we say that at least in its origins, it was okay, and we can accept that, right? But the principles are what they are, and they carried all the way through. All of the changes that followed were based upon those same principles that gave you the changes of 1960 and the changes of 1962. Even some of the changes in the 1950s were based upon those modernist principles. <clears throat> so if they can get everyone to accept those modernist principles, at least they can get everybody, again, tossing the grains of incense before the idol. <clears throat> and... Um, and, and this, this already acknowledges a certain uh, obeisance and a certain acceptance of the, of the whole idea of the, of the Novus Ordo, the New Order. Uh, so it shouldn't be surprising that when they, when they compromise in things that seem, they might seem, you know, on the surface to be insignificant, when you look below the surface, you see the modernists demanded this for a reason. They knew the significance of those demands. <clears throat> we see this playing out now in, uh, in the so-called traditionalist societies, right? They still use the Latin mass within the Novus Ordo. Are they willing to compromise one thing after another? Mm -hmm. By the way, I'm, I'm sorry, Juan, but... Something you said, this, look, I know, I know uh, a priest, <clears throat> I know a clergyman in the, in the fraternity of St. Peter who will publicly say, okay, well, I'm with the fraternity of St. Peter because I believe in the ecclesiastical authority, I believe Francis is the Pope, I believe in the hierarchy, and so I'm loyal, I'm loyal to the church. See, I'm not like those renegade traditionalists who go off on their own, right, and break with Francis and so on. They, they make these claims, but if you talk to them privately, they'll tell you, if you ask them, well, if you were ordered by, let's say, your Pope Francis or Cardinal so-and-so, or your bishop, if you were ordered to say the Novus Ordo, would you say it? No, no, I absolutely would refuse. Uh, well, if you were ordered to stop saying the traditional Latin Mass, would you, would you stop it? No, no, I, I would just carry on. And so you ask yourself, well, why, why are you leading this double life? Why are you speaking with a double tongue? Why are you outwardly, again, burning the incense before this, you know, saying that you recognize their authority? But in fact, your intention is that if they told you to do something you didn't want to do, you, you, you would say, well, heck with that. You know, I'm not going to do anything you say. 
uh, I'm not going to obey you in this. Uh, that, is, that is living a lie. That is a deception. And uh, I find that it is true of those who are outwardly bowing down before the idol of the modernists and the Novus Ordo, but interiorly and privately they will tell you they have no intention of obeying any of this. <clears throat> Even as they are outwardly compromising with it. So I, I find it all to be uh, a sham and a fraud, or represent, really truly reprehensible. And, uh, and these are the ones who are empowering the modernists to do what they're doing, the, 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 the violence they're doing to the faith, the church, to souls. Right. Well, Father, any positive note that we can end on tonight? Well, it seems like, uh, it, and it not only seems this way, it is this way, but, uh, you know, every week that goes by, we have something new coming out of the Vatican, another new atrocity. But as I say, if Francis is emboldened by getting away with this and being protected and defended by the very people who, who should be denouncing what he's doing and exposing it to the world uh, as, as being wrong and against the faith, then we should expect that every week or every day that goes by, he's going to come out with some new atrocity. So there's always going to be something to talk about. But I know people who are very, very uh, knowledgeable about virtually every conspiracy under the sun, okay? I know people who understand modernism. They, they have encyclopedic knowledge of modernists, modernism, of uh, Jewish Kabbalism, which is nothing but the... Uh, the Jewish form of Gnosticism, <clears throat> we, we have Hermeticism and magic and, and all of it. I know people who are encyclopedic knowledge of these things, okay? It's, it's dazzling to hear them talk. But that's not the same as sanctity. I mean, we, can, we know all of these things. We can know all of these mysteries and all knowledge, right? And we can have all prophecy, as St. Paul says. But unless we have charity, none of that is worth anything. So... Um, you know, it is very clear, St. Gregory the Great, Pope St. Gregory the Great said, and the saints themselves have reiterated throughout all the centuries, that to whom much is given, much is required. If God has given us the knowledge of these things, to recognize these things for what they are, there's a greater uh, obligation we have now of faith and hope and charity, gratitude to our Lord. There's a greater obligation we have to love God more because, as St. Paul says, even if I were to give, distribute my goods to feed the poor and deliver my body to be burned and have no charity, it profits me nothing. So no matter what we do, no, no matter what knowledge we have, no matter what we do with that knowledge, if it is not, from, from, uh, if it is not starting with uh, a love for God, and if it does not increase our love for God, then it is, it is not going to save our souls, and it's not going to edify anyone else either. We have to have a real love for God. That should be our, our absolute focus. Uh, we, we adhere to the Holy Mass because we believe absolutely that our Lord is truly present there as God and man, and we love him and we adore him. And when he is here in our tabernacles, we... Uh, show that love by uh, going out of our way to be present there before the Blessed Sacrament and to acknowledge uh, his, his love for us. In other words, it, it, should in, in, it should inspire in us a tremendous zeal for the faith and for the honor and love for God. So I, I could just uh, want to get the point across that... Uh, to everyone, if you, if you are a traditional Catholic and you have the traditional faith and you are living the traditional Catholic religion, then you cannot be lukewarm. This lukewarmness was death. This is how the modernists seized control, through the lukewarmness of Catholics. And uh, God forbid that we should be guilty of that crime of lukewarmness toward our Lord, toward his faith, toward his church. So uh, we have to pray as we should have been praying, as Catholics should have been praying a generation ago. That is how we have to pray now. We have to be sacrificing now as Catholics should have been sacrificing a generation ago, or two, when Fatima took place. We have to be those Catholics now that we needed then to avert the disaster. 
And so I just, it's like a sending out the trumpet call to, to arms, but they're spiritual arms and they are matters. Um, really, the, the armaments we have, as St. Paul said, our faith, our hope, and uh, ultimately our love for God. That's right. Well, Father, thanks for being here tonight. Appreciate your time. Well, certainly, Tom. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. God bless you. Thank you to all of our viewers as well for watching this episode of What Catholics Believe. Until next time, we ask that you all remember the words of Our Lady at Fatima to consecrate yourselves and your families to the Immaculate Heart of Mary and to pray and do penance. Thank you and God bless you.